My name is Lindsay Balance Collins. I'm the pastor of outreach here at University Methodist, and I welcome you into worship this morning. We are grateful for those of you who are gathering here with us in person, as well as those of you who are joining us online. I have a few announcements to draw your attention to. The first one is we have lunch planned for you. You can hang out right after worship today for a spaghetti lunch fundraiser for the youth choir. It's right after worship. It's $8 per person, $25 for a family of four or more, which is a great deal um, compared to going out to eat, and it's for a great cause. Be in the fellowship hall right after this. Hope you will plan to stay and eat and support the youth choir. We have a grief and loss support group that is starting up beginning February 11th. This is through our Stephen Ministry Program. Um, it's for all kinds of losses. We experience a lot of complicated losses in our lives for many different things. Um, and it's just a space of healing for you. If you are interested in this, please contact me or Terry Hamlet. We would be um, happy to get you signed up for this group. And if you have people outside of the church who would benefit from this group, whether they belong to another church or are currently not attending church, they are welcome. This group is, is, is available and open to all folks who are experiencing a loss as well. So please share that information. 
I still need a little bit of help with the Wesley dinner next um, Sunday night. Specifically, I could use some help um, making uh, the main dish that we're serving that night, or if you're able to come and help serve. So if you are available to help me with the Wesley dinner, if you wouldn't mind contacting me, uh, you can email or call me. I would be so grateful. And finally, if you'll take that attendance pad that's right at the end of your pew, if you'll fill it out and pass it down and then pass it back, and if you would prefer, you can scan the QR code on the back of your, um, your pew there, and you can register your attendance that way. Please register your attendance if you're attending online, and please, everyone, make sure to check out the announcements for the day using the QR code for the announcements. We are so glad you are here. Friends, let us worship our Lord. Please stand as you're able for our call to worship. Our Creator has molded and shaped us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Christ is calling our names. We accept the invitation for the wondrous journey of faith. The Spirit is whispering in our hearts. We have been given spiritual gifts to follow Christ and live peacefully with all of God's children.
Let us pray. Merciful God, we live in a world where we more often cultivate anger than compassion and often hold grudges rather than practice forgiveness. You are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. We give thanks that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to lead us into the way of forgiveness, grace, and mercy. Jesus laid down his life for us so that we might know that nothing can separate us from your love. Guide us into your ways of forgiveness, mercy, love, and grace. In the name of Christ, who lives again for us, we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. First, please join me in the prayer for illumination from Henry Bolton. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The reading today is by Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. You have heard that it was said to those who live long ago, don't commit murder, and all who commit murder will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with their brother or sister will be in danger of judgment. If they say to their brother or sister, you idiot, they will be in danger of being condemned by the governing council. And if they say, you fool, they will be in danger of hell, fiery hell. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go. First, make things right with your brother or sister, and then come back and offer your gift. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Today, we begin a new sermon series on forgiveness. And as we prepare to do so, please go with me to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Lord, I pray that you would speak through me and perhaps even in spite of me. And so let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Love and forgiveness are central to the Christian message. I hope that you deeply know the love of God for you. I hope that you have deeply known and received God's forgiveness toward you. And if you struggle to, to feel the love of God and to know the love of God for you and, and struggle to receive God's forgiveness, I hope you'll reach out to me and Pastor Lindsay, Pastor Jameson, one of the clergy here, and help us uh, engage in a conversation with you about these things. Because it's so important that we know the love of God and know the forgiveness of God. Greg Boyle uh, has a book out called Forgive Everyone Everything. It's kind of a devotional book, a compilation of various things he's written in his previous three books. Forgive Everyone Everything. What do you think about that title? Forgive Everyone Everything. Most of us, well, maybe not most of us, I don't want to speak hyperbolically, some of us at least, hear that and we say, that sounds nice, but there is no way I'm going to forgive everyone everything. I've had enough conversations with people just like you to know that we don't want to do that all the time. You hear stories about former bosses that you didn't like. I'm not going to forgive everyone everything, okay? Or former friends, or former spouses, or parents, or children, or siblings, or governments, or political parties, or basketball coaches. <laughs> if I was going to hold a service, if we said we're going to hold a service, maybe during Lent, because I need a season like that to convince you of it, and we were going to have a service of prayer and healing around forgiveness so that those of you who struggled with Coach K <laughs> could be healed of that and, and learn to love him deeply in your hearts. How many, how many of you would come to that service? There's like four people half-heartedly coming to that service. Our least attended service of all the year, of all time here at University Church, apparently. Yeah. Not everybody wants to forgive everyone everything, it seems. But then, 
we say, well, well, Jesus, Jesus, do we want Jesus to forgive everyone everything? How many hands go up? Oh, that's a little bit different. Okay. All right. You want Jesus to forgive everyone everything, but we're not so sure about ourselves. We're not so sure we want to be that Christ-like, but we will surely want Christ to be like himself in this when it comes to us. Forgive everyone, everything. Jesus, Jesus is high on forgiveness here, friends. Jesus will say in the midst of this Sermon on the Mount, like the scripture that was read today. All right, friends, you gotta, you gotta be better in your hearts toward others. So if you're walking around and you're saying, you idiot and you fool, you are in danger of judgment. And then y'all think, well, I can't drive on 40 anymore. I've got, <laughs> for me to be, to do this for Jesus, I can't drive on the highway any longer because I, I think it or I say it in my heart too much. And then Jesus will go on to say, look, if you even remember while you're at the altar offering a sacrifice for your own forgiveness, which by the way takes work, you actually have to do things and, and get, the, get your, your sacrifice together, you got to make the time to get there and go to the altar and do that. If you remember while you're there that there's somebody, anybody, one of your brothers or sisters, who has something against you, leave all that stuff there. Go and be reconciled to them. If someone has something against you, go and be reconciled to them and then come back. You tend to think that this whole idea of, of forgiveness is just between you and, and God. And you forget about the forgiveness that's between you and others, but both are important. In another place, in this very same uh, teaching, Jesus will say to us, as Jesus is teaching us about prayer, you got to forgive others just as, just as you expect God to forgive you. And so if you're withholding it, just know that you're, you're operating in a posture that says, God, I'm okay if you withhold it from me. If you extend it generously, that also says something about your belief. You believe God will generously forgive you, and you hope, that is your hope and your understanding, that God will generously forgive you. Again, forgive everyone, everything. In 2006, many of you will uh, remember this. In 2006, in October, a gunman entered into an Amish school in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. This gunman shot 10 people, um, several of whom passed away ages were 7 to 13. It was an awful incident. In hours, hours after this great tragedy, which sadly has been repeated so often in our country's life. How frequently do we experience the pain of gun violence in schools and in other institutions? Our hearts break over and over again, and we think about what kinds of laws and background checks and how to make sure that there's, uh, we can secure firearms safely in homes. So many kinds of things we do to try to mitigate this because we experience the deep pain of it, and there's there's not, no common agreement about how to mitigate these things in our society, but we all know that we must try. And here's one other incident 
where this happened. I um, experienced this in a different way. Uh, for the first time in, in my life, I had a child. My eldest was just a few months old at the time, and, and I was an associate here at this church at the time. And I began to imagine, well, what would have that been like if that was my child in the schoolroom? This kind of thing happened. It just it hit me in a different way than it had before. And within hours, we saw the American public and the international public saw the members of the Amish community going to be with this gunman's family and experiencing and, and communicating their sadness and regret for what had happened and forgiving this gunman who's, um, who took his own life in the midst of that experience. They, they offered forgiveness and they offered consolation to his family members. And the American public said, what? I just don't get it. I am baffled by this overwhelming display of forgiveness. And it wasn't just the, the American public outside the life of the church. It was people inside the life of the church as well who said, golly, I just don't, I don't get it. If that kind of pain, if that kind of tragedy was visited upon me, I, I got to tell you, there are a few responses I've got, and, and most of them are not that. So the American public became obsessed even with this, this practice of forgiveness as extended by this Amish community. Various studies have been done across time, and some of them have concluded that the American public, generally speaking, doesn't have what it takes to practice that kind of forgiveness. We, we have not learned the practices that it takes to practice that kind of forgiveness. Forgiveness has not been so internalized in our very beings that when we experience tragedy, our first response as an act of healing for ourselves and for others is to extend forgiveness out into the world. That's just not how many of us have been formed, but that is how the Amish community practices forgiveness as a Christian body week in and week out, one of the core disciplines that shapes their lives, that shapes their imaginations, so that when something bad happens to them, that's the first reaction. It's not vengeance, it's not judgment, it's not trying to get back, it's trying to forgive and free their soul individually and collectively and hopefully freeing the soul of others who have offended them as well. It seemed so blessedly countercultural. And dear friends, I'm saying this is the marrow of the gospel. It is blessedly countercultural in that way always it always has been that's what's so striking about it and that's why jesus says that's why the new testament says that our lives we we've got to get saved to, to believe this kind of thing we've got to be transformed to believe this kind of thing because it's it's not easy the fact is it is hard There's so many things that distort the way that we approach forgiveness. Um, one distortion is that we make it, it highly personal. I, I've, I've been guilty of preaching forgiveness like this. Even myself, it's highly personal. It is just for your individual healing. Why do you forgive? 
Well, just so that you can be free, so that you don't have chains, chains that bind you and weigh you down and distort the way that you, you interact. So it's for you. Well, yes, it's in part for you. It is in part for you. But forgiveness is also for others. It's a communal practice, not only an individual practice. It's for your healing and the healing of others around you. That Amish practice wouldn't have been the same if one or two individuals or families practiced it in that way, but it was that common practice that was so shaping and transformative, not only for them, but for the rest of the world as we were watching. So sometimes forgiveness is highly personal in that way. Sometimes it is highly conditional. Look, I will only forgive you if you measure up in these ways. I will only forgive you if you do these things that I believe is proper restitution for what you have done. Then, only then, may I forgive you. Highly conditional. And then we, we go back to this picture of the cross. Like for Jesus, is forgiveness highly conditional? So, so if we make forgiveness highly conditional, then maybe that's why we struggle to receive forgiveness because we just can't imagine a God who were for, would forgive us if we didn't do stuff all the time for God to like us enough to forgive us. It creates a distortion in our theology. Then likewise, we turn it on others as we say, well, like, if I've got a God who, who says, I've got to do these kinds of things to measure up so that I can receive forgiveness, then you do too. So forgiveness becomes hard. In fact, it becomes punishing even in the way that we practice it. That is, that is a distortion. And then sometimes in the midst of our society and culture, we say there's just not going to be any forgiveness at all. I've talked to people, and I've said, look, so uh, about race, for instance, in, in, in what way, in what scenario could, could white people be right enough to where they could be forgiven, forgiven the sins of white supremacy? And I've actually heard people say, they just ain't a way. Ain't a way. I've heard Christians say that. Well, it's okay. So how, how, could, how could, uh, could straight people be, uh, be good enough to, to overweigh, to outweigh the, the offenses that we've had toward our LGBTQ plus siblings? Like, what, what could you do? And I've heard some people say, Look, based on the, the levels of harm, I just can't imagine a way. How could guys, how could guys reduce the level of male toxicity enough to, to stand apart from the patriarchy that's been built up enough to be right enough to be forgiven by all the wonderful women we have around us. I've heard people say, look, it just, it's so, it's so ingrained, I just don't know if there's a way. And I could just keep on going on and on, story after story about things that impact us, our lives that, that make us Maybe even bristle and, and our shoulders get tight even as we, we think about it. Some would say there's just not anything you could do or they could do to merit my forgiveness. And friends, all of that, all of that, even though the harm is real, the offense is real, still all of that creates a capt 
activity of the soul that the gospel of Christ is meant to free us from. We want forgiveness to be a back and forth. I remember someone talking about meeting with their spiritual, spiritual director, and they said, forgiveness is a back and forth. It's like a tennis match, you know, and, it's, and you kind of keep on going until one side is, is satisfied. And, and then the spiritual director said, instead of back and forth, I believe in just forth. I want just the fourth part of it. And he said, what I mean by that is, I want mercy. I want mercy. I want the Christian people to know mercy, to deeply know and internalize the mercy of God for us. It says, in the midst of all human tragedy and suffering, no matter the weight of it, some of which you can and some of which you cannot imagine, that forgiveness is there, and so I hope you find it again. I hope you, you know that mercy again. Forgive everyone, everything. Don't settle for the back and forth of forgiveness that sometimes we demand. Reach for mercy. Let mercy be your goal. Don't feel like you've, we've got to, to work at it and measure up to it. But understand that it's something that has been given, given freely by God. Who knows the sufferings of this world throughout time in ways that we never will. Scripture will encourage us to do justice to love mercy and walk humbly. And over the arc of this sermon series, we'll talk about, in a couple of weeks, we'll talk about justice because one of the things that I think holds us back from forgiveness is how can we live in a just world if there is not the appropriate accountability for the sins that people have committed? So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that as it relates to the cross of Jesus. But today, as I, we think about doing justice, um, loving mercy, and walking humbly, what I want to encourage each of us is to focus on loving mercy. Loving mercy not only for ourselves, because we all want mercy, but to love mercy so much that we deeply want mercy for others. Mercy that has transformed our lives so much as, as individuals that we are, we are hungry, we are excited to see mercy transform everyone even everyone that has offended us in any way. I desperately want that mercy to be poured into that life just as desperately as I want it to be poured into my life because that is loving my neighbor as I love myself. So dear friends today, my, my challenge to you is simply to Love mercy, because mercy is who God is. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.
Friends, let us affirm our faith in our faithful God. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, send your spirit upon us and light our path, that we may travel the road you have prepared for us. The road to reconciliation often feels so treacherous. Anger, disappointment, and grief feel like too large of a chasm to cross. Challenge us to forsake paths that ask little of us and help us resist the evils and temptations of this world, that we may truly follow the way of kingdom living. Lord, in your mercy. We are blessed to share space with college students as our next door neighbors. We give thanks and offer prayers for these students who are currently taking exams. May they perform to the very best of their abilities. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all those anticipating or recovering from surgery this week, including Meredith Dangle's mother, Kathy Baber, Alice Anderson, and Spence, the brother-in-law of Sheila Woods. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all of those who are recovering from illness, including folks recovering from elevated rates of RSV, flu, and COVID, including Sarah Farmer's father, John. And we give thanks and offer prayers for sustenance for the healthcare workers and caregivers who provide for them. Lord, in your mercy. We give thanks for the love and care provided by foster families. We pray that foster parents would have wisdom and discernment as they care for their children's needs, large and small. We pray for physical, emotional, and spiritual healing for foster and adoptive children. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we lift up to you the prayers that are on our prayer list and those that remain in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. And God, we bless this cradle cross on the altar in honor of Rowan Gray Dido Ford. God, may he grow in strength and love and knowledge of you all the days of his life. Lord, in your mercy, we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who has reconciled the world to himself and who taught us to pray. Our Lord, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God is good. And all the time invite Allison to come forward for our generosity moment. Good morning. I'm Allison Wimmert, and I serve on the environmental stewardship team here at University UMC. Uh, University UMC is committed 
to being good stewards of the environment. And as part of that commitment, um, our church council here at uh, UUMC formally adopted an environmental stewardship covenant at their meeting in September. Um, that was in 2023, just a few months ago. This covenant document has been shared with our church leaders and a copy of it is included in our recent church announcements. And uh, in the announcements, along with the covenant, you'll also find a copy of the resolution on environmental stewardship that was passed at the annual North Carolina Conference of um, the North Carolina United Methodist Church. And they passed that in June of 2023. And we're hoping that the church will consult the University UMC, UUMC uh, covenant as we make decisions regarding our church and seek to be good stewards of God's beautiful creation. We seek for creation care to be incorporated as a guiding principle of all our church activities, including worship, discipleship, nurture, and education, community outreach and missions, and our facilities. Uh, the environmental stewardship team invites you to reach out to us if you have any questions about the covenant. And um, also, just looking ahead to the spring, the environmental stewardship team will be planning a special event for the afternoon of Sunday, April 21st. And that's the Sunday, um, the Sunday that's just before Earth Day. And so we hope to share information about that soon. But in the meantime, please mark your calendars. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. It is, uh, it's lovely to be a part of a church where so many people uh, believe deeply in our stewardship and our care of God's good creation. And so I commend you to uh, take part in all the things that Allison mentioned before and do the things that you can do at home in your day-to-day -day lives uh, that represent this care as well. As we move into this time of offering, we invite our ushers uh, to come forward. They'll pass the offering plates uh, along our aisles. You can also give by using the uh, information that's in the bulletin that will guide you as to how you might give digitally. May we give with glad and generous hearts. Appears. 
Our closing hymn is hymn number 57, O for a thousand tongues to sing. This is kind of like the Methodist theme song, the historic Methodist theme song. As we sing this hymn, if any would desire to come forward for prayer, for dedication or rededication of your life to Christ, or to join with our congregation, please join Pastor Lindsay and myself in front of the chancel as we sing. these words of benediction. We have come to worship and we depart to serve. Go forth in the freedom of God to serve God and your neighbor in all that you say and in all that you do. And as you move into this week, remember that we love you. We hope you have a great week and may the peace of Christ be with you.